absolutely uh, the crowd screaming. Happy to have us here. And it felt very welcome. This is where they actually, it felt like they wanted you to be there personally. Hello, welcome to Sparks 1524. I'm Nathaniel Miller. On this episode of Pier Side, I'm going to do something for the very first time. I'm going to do a remake. Most of us, when we hear the word remake, shudder. I shouldn't say most of us, but many of us do. Is the new movie version going to be as good as the old version? It, will the new actors have the same chemistry as the originals? Will they do justice to something that we have fond memories of? A lot of times remakes seem to fall flat, but sometimes they work, and when they work, they really work. The Thing from Another World was a great, fun science fiction, campy movie from back in the 50s. John Carpenter remade that as The Thing in the 1980s, starring Kurt Russell. And the remake is definitely the superior version. It is a true classic of horror and science fiction. Two years ago, in 2022... I told the story of USS Ponce's visit to Bristol, Rhode Island for July 4th, and we did this port call back in 2011. I want to remake this story because my video skills have significantly improved, so I can just tell the story better. But I can also now include some of the voices and words of my shipmates that were also there. The story of a ship is not just the story of one person. The story of the ship is the story of a crew. And now you can start to hear some of the crew's voices beyond my own. I also started this version of my channel at the end of 2020. Uh, I was At that point, I had left my last traditional job, and I was working independently as a novelist and working on getting my first novel out. And I wanted to have a little fun, so I decided, oh, instead of just using my channel to repost videos that I like, let me start my own programming. So I did that. Right before moving across country here to Florida. Not the smartest idea, especially when your skills have atrophied because you didn't use them for five or six years. But hey, that's me. The story of Ponce going to Bristol was a story of us doing our first major operation following a nine-month deployment. For a while there, during 2011, we were the only operational LPD, or amphibious transport dock, on the East Coast. So we were really busy running down to North Carolina back and forth so we could provide a platform for the Marines to train. All that began, however, with us getting underway for Bristol, Rhode Island, so we can be part of the oldest Independence Day celebration in the nation. I remember we went out to celebrate that 4th of July weekend, and everybody was saying to wear your dress white so that you can get more involved with the people celebrating. I wore them early and had a good time. The townspeople were inviting us over, taking pictures, inviting us to good food and drinks in different restaurants and places. I had a good afternoon. Later that evening, I decided to dress down and change into something more comfortable blue jeans and a button shirt. Well, we run into some of our shipmates in uniform. We as sailors usually tease each other in uniform and we said something like, thank you for your service, sounding a bit sarcastic just to get their attention. And as we wave them over to join us, we hear some civilians pulling us to the side and starting to get after us. Nothing happened. We were just surprised they went off on us and my friends in uniform rushed over and explained to them that we're on the same ship and that we didn't mean any harm. As fast as things escalated, they de-escalated with a round of drinks from me and from the guys. Bristol, Rhode Island was incorporated in 1681 as part of the Massachusetts colony, but the British Crown transferred it to the Rhode Island colony in 1747. Thriving as a fishing hub and seaport, Bristol was directly attacked by British forces twice during the Revolutionary War, once in 1775 and again in 1778. The first recorded celebration of the of the Declaration of Independence was actually recorded by, of all things, a British, of all people, a British officer in 1777 who happened to hear the rebels celebrating across Narragansett Bay in Bristol, Rhode Island. This being the first anniversary of the Declaration of Independence of the rebel colonies, they ushered in the morning by firing 13 cannons, one for each colony, we suppose. At sunset, the rebel frigates fired another round of 13 guns, each one after the other. The Navy sent a ship to celebrate at Bristol every year, starting back in 1912 with the cruiser USS Tacoma, CL-18. 
The amphibious transport dock USS Ponce LPD-15 would be the 99th ship heading up there while also carrying a cadre of U.S. Naval Academy midshipmen on their summer training cruises. These cruises give midshipmen a chance to learn everything from navigation to deck seamanship while supported by a safety net of officers and enlisted folks. Events like this also give midshipmen a chance to start gaining experience in the diplomatic dances they'll be required to perform once they're commissioned in the fleet. For the rest of the crew, events like this are a chance to show off our ship, see new parts of the country, and take some time to drunkenly sing karaoke. But more on that later. The Proud Lion was under command of Commander Cole Hayes. Captain Hayes was a damn fine officer and a great seaman. He sadly passed away a number of years ago, but Captain Hayes was the kind of officer you wanted in command. He knew how to keep his crew relaxed, but on their game. He also knew how to do that diplomatic dance so beautifully that every guest aboard ship felt like they were the most important person in the world. Ponce hosted a welcome dinner for the town officials that evening. Since we were anchored out, they got to experience taking a launch out to the ship before spending the evening watching the sunset and hobnobbing on the flight deck. Captain Hayes never erected barriers based on rank. He ensured the evening was open to everyone in the crew, providing, of course, they weren't standing watch. The magicians in the ship's galley provided one hell of a spread that, sadly, didn't quite survive the onslaught of the hungry horde. I'm a photographer. I've covered many soirees like this, hobnobbing a plenty with dignitaries ranging from the President of the Republic of Palau to visiting Chinese and Russian officers to the crews of other U.S. Navy warships. I've always made it a point to watch how the high and mighty interact with the deck plate sailors. After all, you get a good idea of a person's measure by observing how they treat those below them on the proverbial totem pole. Bristol's dignitaries were some of the most personable people I've ever watched mingle with my shipmates. Every guest aboard Ponce appeared to take a genuine interest in our stories and our adventures. I frequently found one or two civilians holding court, but instead of talking about themselves, they were listening in turn to the stories of all the sailors, enlisted and officers, they met that night. One of my best memories about Fleet Week was when I met a mother of her young son, who was about seven or eight years old. There were about three of us sailors in uniform walking around, and the child stopped us, excitedly pulling his mom over and saying he wanted to talk to the military man. Despite being in a rush, I decided to stop to talk to him. I shared stories about the Navy, our travels and experiences, you know, the good ones though. The most memorable part was seeing his face light up with excitement. His smile was so grand, it nearly brought me to tears, realizing how much of an impact I had with him. After my story, we took a picture on his mom's phone, and he gave me the greatest of hugs, thanking me for protecting them every day. All I could do was smile and thank him for his support. On July 2nd, uh, Ponce's softball team played a game against one of the local Bristol teams, and it was a lot of fun. But a number of my shipmates and I discovered that we all were prophets of doom, prophets whose prophecy came true in a very painful way. We noticed numerous residents sitting inside the outfield's outer edge to watch the game, and sometimes kind of creeping closer. We're talking, these people were so close that the outfielders regularly said hi as they fielded the ball. Clearly, this was a train wreck waiting to happen, and we were all proven right when our command master chief hit a spectacular fly ball that soared past the outfield into a perfect home run, except for the ball caroming off a baby's head. Our own corpsmen, who were playing in the game, shot across the field faster than speeding bullets to try and take care of the infant and the family. Uh, the baby was taken to the hospital by a ambu via ambulance. We later found out the baby was fine, thank God. Unfortunately, the CMC was in a pretty foul mood the rest of the day, and none of us could blame him. I mean, that's a horrible thing to have happen. But most of us were just shaking our heads because we'd been watching all these people sit at the very edge of the outfield and keep creeping closer while the ball was in play. We were hosted as the guests of honor at a local drum and bugle corps competition on July 3rd. When we arrived, we had a dickens of a time getting to our place in the stands because everyone and their Aunt Susan wanted to talk to us prior to the start of the event. I even saw a couple of my shipmates being asked to sign autographs by children as the competition got underway. These kids were pretty damn talented. They put on a great show for us. 
The fireworks at the end were also a great way to wrap up the performances because they started building excitement for the big day tomorrow while also celebrating the winners of the competition. I was a hell of a board stock. I had a good time. Um, probably the biggest memory is that's where me and uh, Sean Marcus got our NAMs because the MV Lady C, which was the uh, charter ship that took us from land back out to the Ponce, broke down and blew a main engine head gasket, and we got permission from the Chang to uh, to skip our watches and help the guys on there replace the head gasket. We were up all night, and uh, yeah, like I said, that's what caused our caused us to get our NAMs. Or both of our first NAMs, as a matter of fact. July 4th, 2011 was a beautiful day. Slightly overcast with broken clouds, so it was still relatively sunny, but very comfortable. The weather was awesome. The ride from the Ponce to shore on the Liberty boat was smooth as glass. And the weather, I say it was awesome, beautiful weather for a July 4th parade, which was really good since the formation of our sailors were going to be marching in that parade. Now, as a ship's media guy, I was off to the side photographing the parade, and I got a really good workout running back and forth up and down the parade route, photographing our guys, as well as documenting the parade, and it was a lot of fun. I had help on this one. Once in a while, one of my shipmates would step up to help me cover a big event. HM2 Matthew Sykes, one of our corpsmen, was not standing watch, and he wasn't in the parade, so he volunteered to help me photograph this event. I actually was able to include some of his photos in the public release that I did after the event was over. I thought all those photos, except for the ones that actually went out, were lost when that hard drive crashed. But again, as I was this last couple of years that I've been working on other projects and pulling out old hard drives, lo and behold, I found some of his images. So this time I actually get to showcase some of uh, Matt Sykes' images as well as my own. I had been stationed as a ceremonial guardsman, so I was voluntold to train the marching platoon for the parade, and because of that, I was in colors being the ensign bearer. I had watched the night before, but the skiff that was bringing the next duty section was running late because a few who had overnight liberty could not be found. I was on watch when they finally made it back, and we had like one hour to make it to Main Street. We ended up running through the town in dress uniform, and me with the flag harness and a sheathed ensign. We got there right in time for me to run through dressing the platoon and stating they all needed to listen for my calls because I'm going to relay the XO's orders, and he was leading the platoon. The parade went well for no practice, but after the parade is when the fun started. I was getting ready to go back to the ship when the XO said we did good and that Colors had special liberty with no duty that day. He took the ensign and harness and passed them to someone who was going to the ship to return. Not even five minutes later, me and the other three, I believe it was Matson, Boyd, and Burl, got pulled into someone's house and handed a mojito. It went on like that for three or four hours. We got pulled into complete strangers' homes, given a drink, and told thank you, until we made it to the bar in town where we could have sworn we would pay about $200 each for dinner and drinks, but we never got charged for it. And when I finally made it back to the ship, I was missing my cover, my neckerchief, and my bracket of medals. The morning opened with the requisite speeches given by local civic leaders. Captain Hayes was hailed on stage as one of Bristol's guests of honor. Although I've lost the original audio recording of him, I did locate one of his quotes in which he expressed our gratitude for attending the patriotic exercises. We are all honored to be here. It means a lot to be welcomed by Bristol like this and asked to be part of such an historic celebration. Once the speeches were done, the order was given and the parade began. This parade was everything you'd expect. Entire continental armies of reenactors marched in formation, occasionally demonstrating their flintlock muskets. Many of the town's women also dressed the part, 
honoring those women whose unsung contributions to the Revolutionary War effort helped advance the cause of American independence. Local high school bands were joined by bands from as far away as Georgia and Minnesota, and even the Navy Band Northeast joined in, providing a rolling round of rollicking music while floats floated past the crowd. Veterans of D-Day in Normandy and the landings on Iwo Jima were given an especially loud cheer and applause as they passed by. The more serious and poignant moments were interspersed with levity provided by the Shriners and some very original funny cars. Ponce's formation actually helped. It uh, didn't open the parade, but our guys were one of the earlier uh, units that went past. I've saved it for last as far as talking about the parade because, well, I'm biased. I really think, though, I'm being accurate when I tell you that I think some of the only people who got a bigger ovation than our sailors did were the World War II veterans, and I've got no problem with that. I joked earlier about running up down along the uh, the parade route, which it was joking. Well, I made a joke of it, but I was doing it. So I got to see and got to hear the crowd's reaction to our sailors numerous times before I finally broke off from our sailors to go cover the rest of the parade. And it really does seem like we got one of the biggest ovations until the World War II veterans came along. Helm, reverse engines, full stop. We have some breaking news here at Sparks 1524. Today is July 1st, 2024, and this video was locked up ready for publication tomorrow, July 2nd. But last night, one of our old shipmates got a hold of me. Retired Senior Chief Electronics Technician Andre Wallace provided me another clip of our sailors marching in Bristol. I had to move all over the parade route, but this clip was shot from one vantage point, providing a bit more context about where the proud lions were in the parade's lineup. The Navy Band Northeast approaches. Stepping lively, they play a rousing rendition of Anchors Away before our sailors make their appearance. Look close because eagle-eyed viewers can even spot Andre marching in the lead element just behind our color guard. The story of a ship is the story of a crew, not just one sailor. I love taking photos and telling great stories with them, but I really appreciate it when my old shipmates will share their memories and their imagery as well. That lets me present a broader canvas about the seagoing adventures of USS Ponce. Also, on a trivia note, I was going through one of my old footlockers last night, just organizing things when I came across my old flow coat from the Proud Lion. I wore this thing many a day on that little flight deck, and I should probably wash it because it still smells like the ship. Anyway, I'm really happy I had this chance to share this new material with you. I thank you for your time. Now let's get back to our regularly scheduled video. I remember me taking a picture with a girl from a local music band, and I believe I still have that pic somewhere on Facebook. When we rolled out on the 5th, pulled the hook, got underway, and started moving on with the next set of missions the Navy had for us, we were in a really good mood. It had been a great visit. We had been treated like kings, like heroes. A lot of it, a lot of the people that I talked to and a lot of my shipmates told me they heard the same thing was people would say, oh, my grandfather served in World War II and did this, and it's so, it meant so much that we could do this for you because what he or she did back then, and you're still doing it. All those versions that we're in the same uniform, some relative of theirs, an ancestor or just an immediate family member wore or was still wearing, but and they couldn't thank those people so they could thank them by thanking us. It's very meaningful when you're part of something like that. For me, the fact that my technological skills have improved enough that now I get to share the words and the voices of some of my shipmates recounting their memories of Bristol, and I'm looking forward to that. But I wanted to recount a couple of my own because my own family history gets tied up in this story. My father's side of the family, we were originally the Tatres, T-A-R-T-R-E. Uh, both sides of my family, mom and dad both have a lot of French, but my father's side, 
had left France and gone to Quebec and settled in a town that's called Roxton Falls. Part of that family, part of those Tatres, came into America through Rhode Island, settling in the town of Woonsocket. While we were in town, or we were in port, I was hoping I could rent a car and get up to Woonsocket to see if I can find the family grave, but we were just too busy, but at least I'm in Rhode Island. On the night of the 1st, when we were having the reception aboard the ship, Captain Hayes, of course, introduced me to several dignitaries, one of whom was named Judy Squires, who was one of the general chairmen. And we had a great old chit-chat, and she asked if I'd ever visited Rhode Island before. You know, the usual questions. I mentioned I hadn't, but that my family had come from there. And she said, really? I, oh, really? What part of the mill, what millers are you part of? I said, oh, we weren't. We were the Tatres. Just grandpa, or grandpa, excuse me, changed his name when he left and went to Hawaii. She said, your great-grandfather went to Hawaii? I said, yes, ma'am, somewhere before 1914. Met my great-grandmother and founded my grandfather, who then met my grandmother and founded my father, who went to Texas to found to meet my mother and found my brother and I. I come from a long line of founding fathers and mothers. I did finally get up to Woonsocket in 2018. Saw the family grave, uh, the, and that was pretty cool, and then went back to Bristol and went ate at a restaurant that I ate at in 2011, which brings us back to our July 4th port call. Matt Sykes had helped me photograph the parade, and we, we hung out as Liberty Buddies that day. We decided that for dinner, we wanted to eat at the most expensive place we could find. We wanted seafood. We wanted one really good expensive dinner because this is July 4th, last night of the port call, the big day. Found this place on the waterfront, and I've been there twice, and to this day, I can't remember the name again, even though I was just there in 2018. Had He had lobster. I'm pretty sure he had lobster. I, I had sea scallops. You want the best sea scallops in the United States? Go to Bristol, Rhode Island. O-M-G. Amazing. And they're big sea scallops, too. They're not small. Expensive dinner. I think, you know, each of our bills was around 80 to 100 bucks for each of us. Waitress says that uh, somebody paid for us. We asked who. We wanted to go say thank you. And she said they wanted to remain anonymous, but asked her to pass on their thanks that we were wearing the uniform during a time of a lot of overseas conflicts, as well as their gratitude that our ship came to Bristol to celebrate with the town. Bristol was one of my favorite memories from the military. The streets had red, white, and blue paint instead of double yellow lines. I'm not sure why that fascinated me so much, but it seems to be one of the first parts of the story I always tell when I talk about it. It seemed like there was a celebration everywhere. I actually met a few locals that always had a 4th of July party, and they invited a few of us to their party when we met them in town the day prior. We got there, and the guy had rows and rows of American flags in his yard. They were lined up perfectly. It almost reminded me of Arlington. Then I realized they had names on every one of them, and if I'm not mistaken, I believe it was all of the victims of 9-11. Pulling in the hook and getting underway on July 5th. It was a bittersweet moment. We would love to have stayed in Bristol for a while longer, and not just because that meant we had more time off work. It really meant a lot to be there. The midshipmen we had with us really got a chance to see, right at the dawn of their careers, the value and depth of heritage you get to claim when you join the United States Navy. We all got to see the kind of impact the Navy has on the fabric of American society. Things we probably don't think about, except for those special moments, but they do mean something to a lot of people, not just us. I hope you've enjoyed the story. I am very glad I got a chance to present the words and voices of my shipmates. We had fun in Bristol. We met some great people, and we got to experience a unique part of American history. I don't think any of us will ever quite forget that unforgettable port call. And I'm glad I have this time to share with you. So until I meet you next time here on Sparks 1524, happy Independence Day. Go do some great things. Well, first, it was amazing uh, wearing my uniform out in town, uh, interacting with the locals and hanging out with the crew was absolutely unbelievable uh, and a great experience. Probably my best memory of it is hanging out with our main propulsion assistant, Ed Menezes. Uh He was prior enlisted senior chief like I was at the time. And uh, we just really enjoyed spending time together watching the sailors. And our uh, most memorable moment is probably hanging out at some bar. I can't remember the name of it, but we went in there and there was a ton of sailors from the engineering department. 
and they were singing and doing karaoke and having a great time with the locals. Uh, so we went in and had a few too many tequilas, and before I knew it, I was up on stage singing Sex on Fire uh, to karaoke. One of my best memories uh, in the Navy ever. Helm, reverse engines, and full stop. We have some breaking news here at Sparks 1524. I'm still Nathaniel Miller. Today is July 1st, 2024. I need to plug that light in.